Welcome everyone. We will be starting our program shortly. Good to see a lot of people joining us tonight for this set webinar that we're going to be having. As people are joining, uh, just to get you thinking about the topic for tonight, I'd like people to put in the chat box uh, what you're doing in your own garden to prepare it for the winter months. So put that in the chat box, what you are doing in your garden to start preparing it for the winter months. With all the recent rain and the cooler temperatures, we're definitely moving into fall, removing my plants, and wanting to plant cover crops. It's a good thing to do for the fall, winter time frame. So we'll be starting our program shortly. Planted broccoli and fall lettuce and have fava beans to plant. Harvesting, oh, harvesting, yeah. I've been doing a lot of harvesting, that's for sure. Especially before the rains, I, I picked a lot of tomatoes before the rains hit. Have planted one raised bed. Miss that one, let's see. In crimson clover for cover crop, hoping it gets well enough along before the, the sun disappears. <laughs> so a lot of preparing of, with cover crops. So we'll be getting started just in a minute. Um, but before we do, if, if anyone has any idea, any comments as to what you're doing to prepare your garden for the winter, you can put those in the chat box. Removing spent plants and soaker hoses, covering with thick layer of brown leaves. So a lot of cleaning up, cleaning up of gardens. Rearrange my herbs, okay. Harvesting. So it looks like a lot of people out there are very busy right now getting ready for the winter months. So that's great. So I think it's about time to get started. So, um, let me welcome all of you to our seminar this evening. My name is Juliet Bender, and I'm the Vice President of the OSU Lane County Master Gardener Association. And I would like to welcome you to our monthly seminar series, which we hold the third Tuesday of each month at 630. All of our seminars are recorded and posted on our YouTube channel, and we'll have a link for that for our YouTube channel later on in the program. All of the questions will be handled at the end of the talk. And I would uh, ask you to put those questions in the Q&A box. And feel free to put those questions in at any time during the talk. You don't need to wait until the end to put those questions in. And Sharon Roberts, who's another master gardener, will be coordinating those questions at the end. Also for tonight's talk, closed captioning is available. It can be turned on and off with the CC button on your screen. So I think that's all the housekeeping issues that we have. So let me turn to introducing our speaker for tonight who is Erica Cherno, who will tell us how to prepare your gardens for the cold winter months ahead so that you have a head start for next spring. She will talk about cleaning up the garden, protecting your soil, preparing perennial plants, and winterizing equipment. 
Erica is a pro assistant professor of practice with OSU Extension in Lane County, where she works with commercial tree crop and berry producers and oversees the Master Gardener program. And I can say that we are very happy to have her here in Lane County. She is a wonderful asset to us. Erica has over 20 years of experience working in the horticultural and organic agricultural industry. So with that, let me turn it over to Erica. Thank you for having me, got myself off mute. All right, so let's get started. Um, so we're going to talk tonight about putting your garden to rest, although some of you may not be putting it to rest. You may be doing fall and winter gardening. I'm not going to go into great detail about fall and winter gardening this evening. That's a whole separate topic. I actually gave a presentation on fall and winter gardening just a couple of weeks ago as part of our virtual summer celebration. You can find that talk on our Lane County Master Gardener YouTube channel. Um, which there is a link to in the chat box. So if you're interested in that topic specifically, I, I uh, highly recommend you refer to that, that presentation. Tonight we're going to talk about not everyone does fall and winter gardening, and you just kind of want to know what you need to do to kind of clean up around the garden. And as Juliet said, give it a jump start for the following spring. So we'll start with the cleanup portion because that's kind of important. So you probably still have summer crops in the ground right now. You might still have some tomatoes on the vine. Um, peppers that you're keeping your fingers crossed will ripen up, et cetera. Um, so the first thing to do is to start um, kind of removing those plants. And I'm a big fan of collecting and saving seeds. Um, and I encourage all of you to learn a bit about seed saving as well. If you're a beginner, start with beans and peas. They're very easy to save. You do have to leave the plants in the ground a bit longer because you have to essentially allow them to go into that seed production st stage and start to dry out as well. So typically with uh, beans and seeds, you're going to wait till those pods, the bean pods or the pea pods start to actually uh, dry, turn brown and dry. Um, and then at that point, you can um, collect the seeds from them, remove any debris and then store them in some type of package. It's good to label and date them and identify what variety they are. And then you save them because seeds only stay good for usually a couple of years. It really depends on the seed type. Um, and then you're going to want to store them in a cool, dark place. And that photo, I do have um, some seeds in clear plastic or clear jars, and those are great because they're airtight. You could actually take those and put them in a freezer um, and store them there if it's really well sealed. Um, but if you were storing those elsewhere and they weren't in a, in a room that's very dark, you would want to put some type of paper around them. You don't want to expose the seeds to sunlight because that could um, trigger them to start um, germinating essentially to come out of dormancy. So make sure you're storing them in a, in a cool, dark and dry place uh, for seed selection. In addition to beans and peas, tomatoes are fun to uh, save as well. You do have to kind of ferment them a little bit to get that gelatin type coat um, away from the seed itself and then dry them out. Uh, peppers are fairly easy to save as well. Lettuce. Um, is easy brassica crops as well, like broccoli. You can let a head of broccoli go to seed and it develops these long uh, seed pods. Um, again, you do have to then leave it in the ground for quite a bit longer. So if you're planning to cover, uh, plant a cover crop, sometimes that can really compete for space in your garden. I've done it before where I, you know, typically for seed saving, you just need one plant, right? You're gonna get tons of seeds off of that one plant. So what I've done before, if I'm saving, for example, um, let's say a broccoli plant, I would maybe harvest and remove all the residues from all the other broccoli plants and leave the one plant that I wanna save for seed and let that kind of go to seed and, and start to dry out the seed pods. And then I might plant a cover crop around the base of that. So you can still get a cover crop in the ground that have that one broccoli plant remaining that you allow to go to seed for seed, seed saving purposes. So that's one thing that you could be doing this fall. Obviously, you want to also finish harvesting any of your summer crops. And I just want to note a few things like with tomatoes, if they're still green, but you really want to get them out of the garden, you can harvest those tomatoes, leave them on a windowsill or somewhere in your house, and they will ripen off the vine. Obviously, they don't have quite the flavor that they do um, when you harvest them when they're ripe, but they will ripen up or you can do as my grandma used to do and make some nice uh, fried green tomatoes as well. Pepper plants are another one. You do want to harvest them before frost hits. 
Um, and that's usually sometime in early to mid October. Um, and if, if you still have pepper plants in the ground and peppers on them, and we do end up getting say an early frost, what you can do is actually cut the whole plant down, hang it upside down in your house or somewhere, you know, in a garage or something um, with the peppers still attached to them. And those peppers will start to ripen up or finish ripening, I should say, um, on the plant. Uh, with winter squash, if you're gonna store them, it's better to harvest them before frost hits. Um, if you're just going to kind of eat them fresh or you're using them to save some seed, you can go ahead and leave them in um, and, and they won't be impacted by frost much at all. But if you really want them for storage, um, to store them into the winter months, it's best to get them off the vine and harvested before the frost hits. And then potatoes are another thing that are going to come out of the ground here in a couple weeks. Um, as soon as your tomato plants start to die and, and kind of topple over, that's essentially a time that you can start digging and harvesting those. And obviously you wanna clean them, um, remove any of the green potatoes. You don't wanna eat those. So that green skin indicates that uh, it has some type of carcinogen in them. So you don't wanna eat those. Um, any potatoes that have any type of soft or mushy spots, you wanna discard those. But the rest of them, you can kind of rub the dirt off of them, um, allow them to cure for a couple of weeks and then just put them in a, in a nice uh, dry, cool place for them to store uh, over winter. So finish harvesting up your summer garden. And then once you've done that, then you can start removing all that plant debris. And all that plant debris is great material for compost. Um, so anything that's kind of dry and brown is gonna be your carbon material or your brown material for your compost. Anything that's still fresh and green is gonna be that high nitrogen material. So uh, a lot of that plant de debris makes great composting material with one caveat. If, if you had some really diseased plants, or anything that just had a huge insect infestation on them, it's, it's best not to compost those. Um, you'd be better off putting those in the yard waste bin for to take off to the landfill or, or to one of the um, land waste companies here in Eugene or Springfield, um, unless you know that you're really good at hot composting. If you know for a fact that your compost gets up to about 150 degrees for about three days straight, then you can go ahead and throw it in your, your compost bin and be assured that it is gonna kill any weed seeds or uh, disease pathogens that may be on that plant. But if, if, you're, if you aren't quite confident in your composting material and you don't know if it's getting hot enough, it's best not to compost diseased materials. Um, other things you wanna do around your garden is obviously remove any type of stakes or trellises or other type of equipment. You don't wanna leave anything in the yard that's just gonna be exposed to the elements over winter that could corrode, um, be exposed to freeze thaw cycles that can cause certain things to crack as well. So just kind of clean up and get everything out of the yard. And then once you've cleaned up, um, you can start kind of filling uh, areas back in. So one thing you might do is start uh, mulching. And I'm gonna talk a bit more about mulch in a second, but applying mulch around the base of your plant. So you're gonna have a lot of fall leaves probably around your yard. You can rake those up and use those as a mulch. Um, anytime after Labor Day, you don't have to really irrigate your lawns anymore. You can kind of let them go and conserve water at this point. I, I mean, if you're really like a nice green lawn and we end up having you know some dry, a dry month of October, then you may need to irrigate once again. But really a general rule of thumb is you can turn off and stop irrigating your lawns after Labor Day weekend. If you plant any uh, trees, especially fruit trees this fall, and fall is a good time to plant fruit trees, you'll wanna protect them from sun scald. So that means um, painting the outside of them with a, a latex paint, you wanna use a exterior white latex paint, do one part paint to one part water, and you wanna paint at least the bottom 18 to 24 inches of that tree. And what that's gonna do is protect it from the sun. If, if a tree, a young tree like that, that's you know just at one to three, three years old, let's say, if it gets really exposed to sun scald, um, you know, it's just got a thin layer of bark on it at that point. It can cause that bark to kind of uh, peel and crack, and that can um, allow for entry of all sorts of bacteria or fungi or even insects that will bore into the trunk of that tree and essentially kill it. So be sure to protect uh, your young trees. They also have guards you can buy. They have paper guards, and they come in all sorts of different uh, types shapes and sizes and materials. And you can also just put a guard wrap around it as well. You do wanna be careful with those. Sometimes they can 
sit up against the trunk of the tree and kind of uh, keep moisture in there as well. So sometimes it's good to just check and make sure that there aren't any suckers growing up underneath those or that they aren't just kind of harboring and creating um, ideal conditions for, for fungi and bacteria as well. And then of course, you wanna store any equipment and fertilizers. Uh, fertilizers should be stored in a dark, cool, dry place, um, high up on a shelf away from children or pets and things like that. And then any type of equipment, don't leave it lying around the yard. Even things like shovels, they get, you know, they can start to corrode over time. So if you wanna take good care of your equipment, get it out of the yard and protect it from the winter elements. Fall is a really great time to test your soil. If, if there's anything lacking, you can start the process of amending it or planning for next year to amend it. One of the really important things to test here in Western Oregon is the soil pH. So soil pH is, tells you how either acidic or alkaline your soil is. And if it's too high or too low, that really impacts nutrient uptake in the plant. It kind of disrupts those biological processes in the soil as well as the solubility of um, certain uh, fertilizers as well. So you typically, for most vegetable plants, if we're talking vegetable garden, um, or even just you know your typical ornamentals, they're gonna want a pH around 6.5. There are obviously acid loving plants like blueberries that are gonna want a pH around you know 5.5 or dendrons as well. But anything else, you wanna make sure that that pH is around 6.5. And we do tend to have acidic soils here in Western, so in Western Oregon. And soil does become more acidic over time. Um, you know, precipitation can acidify uh, the soil very slowly and we get a lot of rain here in Western Oregon. So test the soil. Um, if you can afford to do a complete soil test, that's great. That's not gonna just tell you soil pH, but also the different macronutrients like nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, as well as the micronutrient content in your soil. And then you can uh, um, adjust the soil or add um, whatever it may be that you're deficient in. And I just wanna make a note that we are offering soil pH testing. We do have a soil pH testing day scheduled for October 1st at the Lane County Extension Office from two to six. If you go to our OSU Extension Lane County website and go to the events calendar, uh, you can find more information about that event. So if you're interested in getting the soil pH tested, um, you may wanna look into that. Again, please note that it is just a soil pH test. If you're interested in also testing the, the macro and micronutrients of the soil, getting a more complete soil test, then down at the bottom of the screen, you can see there's a publication called Analytical Laboratory Serving Oregon. You can find that on our OSU Extension um, catalog, and you just type in EM8677, and it will pull up that publication. I'll just go ahead and tell you um, in the valley, there's the OSU Soil Health Lab up in Corvallis. There's also ANL Western up in Portland, and you can actually ship a soil sample to them. They don't need a lot. They literally, you know, a quart bag of soil is essentially going to give them enough. Not, they don't need too little either. Um, we've had some soil pH testing days recently, and I've had people bring me in like two tablespoons of soil. That's not enough either. So they could, they need a good three quarters to a cup of soil. Um, to be able to really test it. Um, but if you're interested in soil pH, uh, check out the event on October 1st. If not, um, if you want, want to go beyond that, really know the nutrient status. I do encourage you to do a complete soil test um, occasionally, like every three years. It's not a bad thing to do. I know AML Western, you can do a complete one for about $15. Um, it'll tell you pH. Um, it'll even give you like organic matter percent. It'll tell you the texture of your soil. Um, so that is worthwhile doing mostly for the nutrient status. You don't want to be over fertilizing your soils. Um, you don't want to be applying nitrogen for the sake of nitrogen or even phosphorus. So it's good to do a complete soil test every couple of years just to find out if you're lacking any nutrients or if you're in excess of any nutrients as well. Um, once you've done a soil test and you figure out what you need to correct, whether it be the pH of the soil or even some type of nutrient, then you can start planning for that. Um, fall is a really good time to add lime. So some type of calcium carbonate, that's gonna raise the pH of your soil. Um, so fall is a good time to apply it because it essentially allows um, the material to kind of dissolve and react with the soil. So that by the time the spring rolls around, um, hopefully the pH of your soil has already been corrected and you can go ahead and just plant right into it. Um, fall is also a good time to, if you're using like organic um, materials for phosphorus, if you have a phosphorus deficiency in your soil, be careful. 
Um, the place I used, I used to run a garden up in Salem and our soils were always super high in phosphorus. And um, some of the soils here in Western Oregon tend to be that way. So don't just apply phosphorus if you don't need it. But if you do, if you find, take a soil test and find you're deficient in phosphorus, then fall is a good time to apply materials like bone meal and rock phosphate. So they're, they're either coming in like a powder or a granular form. And phosphorus is largely immobile in the soil, so it doesn't move a lot. Um, so you can apply those in the fall. And once again, by the time spring rolls around, those materials will be ready, ready available for the plants um, to take them up when needed. Things you don't want to apply in the fall, even if your soil test says you know, deficient nitrogen, although typically with soil tests, we don't test nitrogen because it is um, so mobile and it, it's kind of hard to measure in the soil, but typically you don't want to apply high nitrogen materials in the fall. Nitrogen is highly mobile in the soil and it can be easily leached out by all the fall and winter rains. So it just gets washed through the soil and into our groundwater and into our waterways where it causes eutrophication and other types of um, pollution and other types of issues. So don't apply fresh compost. You know, you can apply finished compost as a mulch in the fall, but if it's fresh un unfinished compost or fresh manure or other materials that are really high in nitrogen, it's best um, to wait to apply those in the springtime. So one of the really important things you can do over winter and fall is protect your soil. Um, if you've heard me talk before, you know I'm a big fan of cover crops. I won't go too in depth to those tonight, but um, up in the right hand corner, I just kind of want to explain the process of erosion. Um, it takes fi about 500 years to create one inch of topsoil. So it is, we start to lose soils to erosion and other types of issues. Keep in mind that it takes a long time to kind of replace that. So protecting the soil from the impact of rain, you know, when a raindrop hits the soil, it basically takes soil particles and breaks them apart from the soil aggregates. And once those particles are detached, they can easily be picked up by wind or water and move to other places. They wash into our drain systems or and, and kind of clog up our, our you know, um, waterways and things along those lines. So protect your soil from the impact of rain, which is really important here in Western Oregon, again, where we get a lot of rainfall. And there's a couple of ways you can do that. One easy way to do that is through mulching. And I'll talk a little bit more about mulching in a second. Um, you can also do what's referred to as sheet mulching. So sheet mulching is kind of what you see down there on the bottom where you use either newspaper or cardboard, and those are both carbon-based materials. So your browns, if you think of, of composting in terms of greens and browns, that would be a brown material. And you just kind of layer it on the soil, um, on a bare piece of soil that maybe you aren't going to garden for the winter that you just want to protect. Um, and then on top of that, you can throw some type of, a couple inches of some type of mulching material. That can be finished compost, that can be leaves. I've seen people use grass clippings. Etc. And essentially what that cardboard or newspaper is going to do is it's going to block out some mites. So it's going to prevent any winter weeds from germinating and becoming a problem. So if you don't like weeding in the middle of winter, um, you know, either sheet mulching or cover cropping or even just mulching in general is a great thing to do. It not only protects the soil, but prevents weed seeds from germinating, especially as those winter weeds. Um, so that cardboard is going to kind of block out the sunlight and then um, you're going to throw that nitrogen mulch material on top of it and slowly over time over winter that material is going to start to break down and so in spring you just end up with a, a nice one inch or two inch layer of organic matter sitting on the top of your soil. So sheet mulching is a great way to protect a bare piece of ground that you don't plan on cover cropping and you're trying to figure out what to do with it. Um, it, it's really going to kind of protect the soil um, from, from the impacts of, you know, freeze-thaw cycles as well as raindrops as well. And then, of course, the other thing and one of my favorite things to talk about is cover cropping. So that's a great thing to do over winter as well. Um, just real quick on mulching, just for those who aren't familiar, mulching is essentially any material that you're going to place on top of the soil surface to protect the soil. So Mulches can be synthetic materials, think of about like landscape fabrics, but they can also be organic materials as well, things like leaves or straw. And you want to use straw and not hay. I get this question a lot. So straw, um, the seeds are, are typically mostly removed from it, whereas hay is still going to contain some of the, the uh, seeds. 
So it will kind of germinate again and become almost a little bit of a weed itself if you're using a hay mulch. And then hay also typically has um, more herbicide residues on it than straw. So if you're looking for mulching materials, use straw, not hay. Finished compost makes great mulching material as do um, grass clippings. And I've already mentioned a couple of the benefits in terms of reducing erosion and runoff and weed suppression, but mulch also helps improve infiltration of water into the soil. So we don't get that, you know, sheets of water running off and causing erosion. It can help regulate soil temperature. So it kind of insulates the soil during winter and prevents a lot of those freeze thaw cycles that can happen. A lot of those mulching, mat mulching materials contain carbon, and that carbon is essentially food for a lot of those soil organisms. So you're essentially feeding the soil when you're using some type of organic mulching material as well. And then also, um, eventually that's going to break down and become organic matter. So you're essentially adding organic matter to your soil, which is really important as well. Um, one of the downsides is, you know, obviously, slugs enjoy hiding underneath some of these materials so it can provide habitat for slugs and other types of critters. Um, and then also in the in the um, in the springtime, uh, you know, that mulch can kind of prevent blocking out sunlight. So it kind of prevents the soil from warming up quicker, which means you may have delayed planting in the spring. So typically once spring rolls around, if there's any mulching material laying on the surface, like I usually use a straw mulch, that's still laying there and I want to start planting or preparing the planting, I'll just kind of move that off, kind of just gently move it off into the aisle so that that soil starts to get exposed to sunlight and can start warming up a little bit so you can get, it, get in there and plant your uh, spring and summer garden. Um, in terms of insulation in the wintertime, it's good to have about a four to six inch layer of mulch um, to insulate the soil and once again kind of prevent those freeze thaw cycles that can happen. Uh, in this kind of year. I'm not going to go too much into cover cropping. If you've heard me talk before, you know I love talking about cover crops. I've done several talks on it. In fact, our Lane County YouTube channel has a talk that I did about a year ago on cover cropping. So if you're interested in hearing an entire lecture on it, please go and watch that recording. But cover crops are essentially any plant that you're not going to harvest. Um, although you can, in some cases, with like peas or fava beans, get a harvest out of them, but that's not the purpose of you growing them. The purpose of growing a cover crop is to protect the soil. If you're using a legume cover crop, they have that nitrogen fixing capability where they're taking atmospheric nitrogen and fixing it into the soil. So it's essentially a free nitrogen fertilizer. And then they also um, add a lot of organic matter to the soil as well. So you're getting that soil protection, weed suppression, um, you're building healthy soils, like cover cropping is really one of the best things you can do, particularly in the winter. If you aren't doing any fall or winter gardening and you have spaces that you, you normally would leave bare, throw down a cover crop. It's, it's just a great thing to do. You do have to terminate the cover crop the next year, so you have to cut it down. And then um, you can either do kind of the cut it down and mulch it and then plant into it, or you can turn it back in and allow it to decompose and it will just add a bunch of organic matter to your soil. So here's a couple of recommendations for cover crops that do well in the Pacific Northwest for winter time. There's also cover crops that you grow in summer, but obviously we're heading into fall. Um, so winter, and you do want to get these in soon. Um, typically you want them in the ground about four weeks before first frost. That way they have time to germinate and establish themselves before frost hits. Um, so things like Austrian field peas, Again, that's going to be great for nitrogen fixation. You will get, you can actually harvest and eat the peas off of them as well. Um, any type of cereal rye is great, an annual rye. If you have an area, you know, if you have a little orchard area in the back, they do have perennial rye grasses as well. And those you can just mow um, and, and they stay in the ground year round. You only have to replant them every couple of years. So if you're looking for more, there are perennial cover crops available if you're looking for something that will stay in the ground longer. But most people are just looking for something that you plant in the fall and remove in the spring um, so that you can have your garden next year. Crimson clover is also great. Another nitrogen fixer, the bees and other pollinators love it. And it's just beautiful. I was um, driving up I-5, a, a you know, earlier this year up to the research site that I work at sometimes, and there's just entire fields planting with it planted in crimson clover. It's just really beautiful to see. Um, very attractive plant. Um, vetch is also great. Um, good nitrogen fixer. It's good to plant 
that in a mix with some other type of cereal, like a cereal rye, because it is a whiny plant, so it gives us something to kind of latch onto and climb up as well. Be careful with that. It can become a bit of a weed, so you do want to get it out of the ground uh, before it goes to seed. That's really important with a lot of these cover crops as well. Uh, a couple others are fava beans. I saw a few people in the chat mention that they're going to plant some fava beans. Again, that's something, it's a nitrogen fixer, but you do also get an edible crop out of it. Winter wheat is a great one. Um, typically, you know, if I'm kind of late getting in my cover crop, uh, winter wheat's a good one. It, it can usually still germinate going up into mid-October. So if you're late getting a cover crop in the ground, try, try winter wheat. Um, annual ryegrass. Um, and these grasses and cereals, they have really fibrous root systems. So any nitrogen that's left out of the soil, left in the soil, they're going to kind of take them up and store them in their plant tissue over winter. And then when you turn that crop back into the soil in the spring, it's going to then release that nitrogen that's stored in them. So they're, they're often referred to as catch crops. Those fibrous root systems also break down and become organic matter. So while Legume crops are great for fixing nitrogen. A lot of these cereals um, and, uh, you know, the wheats and things like that, those are really uh, great for adding organic matter to your soil. And oftentimes with cover crops, you want to plant a mix. Um, and oftentimes they're sold as mixes as well. So you'll get something that maybe it has a nitrogen fixer as well as um, some type of grass or cereal that's going to really protect the soil and also add a bunch of organic matter to the soil as well. And then the last one I'll mention is uh, Isalia. Again, beautiful flower, pollinators love it. It's that purple flower that you see there at the bottom. Um, so that's another great option for winter cover crops. So again, protect your soil this winter, very important to prevent erosion and runoff um, and mulching, sheet mulching, or even uh, cover cropping are really easy and great ways to do that. In terms of perennial plants, um, any plants that are perennials that are overgrown, it's a good time to kind of dig, divide, and replant them. You don't want to wait until late fall, so really early fall is the best time to do that. So you've probably got a couple more weeks before it becomes too late. Um, for any flower beds, um, you know, perennial flowers, you want to cut them back, things like lilies or peonies, um, just cut them back to about two to four inches. Uh, take any plant debris, don't just leave it sitting there, um, take it and compost it or put it in your yard waste bin. Um, and then the only exception to that are spring bloomers. You don't want to cut those back or else you'll be removing your blooms. So go ahead and leave those as is. But other types of perennial flowers can essentially just be cut back at this time of year and then you just compost any of the, the material that comes off of them. Um, and then of course you want to mulch around the base of your plants as well. The other thing I want to talk about is winterizing equipment. Um, so most of you probably have some type of irrigation equipment or you at least use hoses around your garden. Um, so it's important to kind of protect those materials so they, they're more durable and, and last longer. So with any types of hoses or irrigation tubing, whether that be you know, drip lines or, or soaker hoses, you want to drain those and get the water out of them so that if we get a freeze event and the water freezes in those, it's good that, that frozen water is going to expand and it can cause cracking and other types of issues um, for the hoses and, and tubing material. So go ahead and drain those. A good way to do it is if you have a hose, just run it over. Let's say you could put um, a chair and just kind of run it up over the side of the chair. And as you're running it up over the side of the chair, it's just going to keep pushing water down the hose and it will eventually flush all that water out and drain it as well. If you use drip irrigation and you're applying fertilizer for your drip irrigation, it's good to kind of flush those out a little bit. I'm, I'm guessing most people in the home garden aren't doing that. Um, some of you may be though, um, especially if you're using organic fertilizers, those can really kind of dry and crack inside um, some of the drip tubing. So flush them out with just water. If you need to add a acidifier, do so, um, and then drain them and remove them. It's best if you can store your hoses in say a garage or somewhere a bit warmer, but you can also leave them outside. Um, they will just of course have a, a shorter lifespan um, if you do so. But the most important thing is getting the water out of them. So, you know, once the freezing starts, they're, they're um, not exposed to that. Obviously, you want to turn off any underground sprinklers or drip systems. 
And then if you any above ground portions of irrigation, you want to um, basically protect them with foam or some type of insulating material um, to once again, just kind of protect them from those freeze thaw cycles. So obviously you would turn off the outside valve um, to your water and then put some type of insulating material around them and just protect the, the valve mechanisms and the piping itself. In terms of other equipment, things like sprayers, if you have a backpack sprayer that you use, again, make sure that the tank is empty, that uh, hoses are drained out and that it's cleaned out um, and stored away for safekeeping over winter. Uh, power equipment, things like string trimmers or lawnmowers. Um, for lawnmowers, uh, do clean them before you put them away. Don't leave like wet grass just kind of lying inside the blades and the, in the, in the cutters. Clean that out with uh, some type of brush or even just a hose and remove that. Um, that wet grass will start to kind of decompose and you know, the, also just the, the contact with water can cause er, uh, corrosion and other things like that. So for the life cycle of your lawnmower, you know, clean them off. Um, and then if you're using a gas powered lawnmower, you really wanna kind of uh, either drain the fuel or add some type of stabilizer to them. So um, if you don't have a lot of fuel in your gas tank, you can either just drain it out or you can siphon the gas out of the tank. And then you wanna just start the engine, let it idle until it basically runs out and, and turns itself off. Um, if you don't want to do that, if you want to leave the gas in the tank over winter, then you will need to, you know, go to Home Depot or, or Jerry's or somewhere and uh, get a stabilizer to add to the gas. It's also a good time to change the oil. You don't, if you aren't using your lawnmower or your string trimmer over winter, um, you don't want to leave the oil just sitting in the engine. Uh, this is a good time to kind of change it and put in some fresh oil. If you have an electric lawnmower, um, remove the battery, store it inside. Batteries tend to need to be stored between 40 and 80 degrees. So, um, you know, if, if you can put them inside a house somewhere where it's not going to be exposed to temperature fluctuations, uh, that's going to expand the life cycle of that battery as well. And then for things like lawnmowers, it's a good time to kind of oil, lubricate any type of turning, rotating parts on it, whether that be the meat of the wheels or other parts, and then also, you know, spark plugs on lawnmowers tend to be, you need to change those about once a year. Most people don't, but that's ideally what you should be doing. So winter is also a good time to get a new spark plug and add that. Um, it's also a really great time to clean and sharpen and oil tools, whether those be pruners or any other type of equipment that you have. Um, you probably, you know, pruners you'll obviously be using um, probably around January when you start pruning. Your, your trees and other types of uh, plants, whether it be cane berries or something. Um, but now's a good time to kind of clean them up, sharpen them and make sure they're well oiled and lubricated. Uh, and if, if you're storing them away for winter storm in a nice dry place, I will note that we also had a very good talk. I don't mean to keep directing you to our YouTube channel, but we did have a really good talk on uh, cleaning and sharpening tools during our summer celebration. And once again, you can find that on the Lane County Master Gardener YouTube channel. In terms of other tasks, uh, now's a really good time to get out and do some slug control. Slugs are going to start laying eggs sometime in late fall. And once those eggs hatch and spring comes around, you're going to have a whole new population of slugs. So this is kind of a good time to get out and do some slug control just to lower that population before they start reproducing. Um, so a good way to do that is with board traps. And with a board trap, you simply, as you see in that top right hand photo, you just kind of want to scrape any green material off the top of um, the surface. So you're just kind of removing a little bit to expose like just wet, clean soil. And then you can take a board kind of like what you see here. Um, here they put two little um, perpendicular slabs on it just so it's a bit raised so that the slugs can get under them. If you really want to attract the slugs, you'll drop a couple, you know, pellets of bait into that clean soil surface. And then you just lay that board trap right on there and the slugs will just migrate there. Um, and then you can essentially lift that board up and there they all are hiding on the under, underside of that board. From there, you can just drop them into soapy water or beer or whatever you want uh, to kill them. Um, feed them to the chickens, whatever it is you wanna do. Um, so board traps are a great way to kind of get out and uh, capture some of those slugs. 
before uh, they start uh, reproducing in, in late fall. Um, this is also a good time to take do a lot of propagation by cutting for things like roto, rhodes, um, camellias, geraniums. You can do some great propagation by cutting. And once again, I'm going to refer you to our OSU Master Gardener Lane County YouTube channel because Shirley um, uh, Master Gardener gave a great talk on plant propagation during our summer celebration. And so I'll just refer you to that talk. It's about a 30 minute talk. So it goes into great depth about how to take a cutting and what's good to propagate this time of year as well. Um, this is also a great time to plant things like ground covers and trees and shrubs. Um, a lot of those kind of woody ornamentals uh, fall is a good time to get them into the ground. Um, again, with trees, you do want to protect the trunks of those trees from sun salt, so be careful with those. It's also a great time to plant bulbs for spring flowering plants, things like daffodils. And of course, this is also an excellent time to get some garlic in the ground if you want to grow some garlic over winter. There's other things you can plant for fall. Obviously, you, some of you may be growing beets and carrots and brassica crops and other types of things. There's a lot you can grow into the winter months. But for most people, they, you know, gardening in the winter, um, a lot less active. But still, you know, garlic doesn't take a lot of care. You can essentially plop the cloves in the ground and kind of walk away. Usually once they, the garlic starts to sprout up, I do like to mulch around them um, to just kind of protect the area around the garlic, but then you can just leave it there. The, the thing to keep in mind with garlic is it is going to be in the ground a long time. So it will be there until next June uh, when you would go then go to harvest. So if it's somewhere that you planned on growing, say lettuce in the spring, just keep in mind you're still going to have garlic in the ground at that time. So you do have to do a little planning. Um, so those are some of the other important tasks. I mean, there's other things like, you know, peach leaf curl. Um, you're gonna wanna start doing a copper spray in November. That's an important time if you have a peach tree and you're, you wanna protect against curl, important time to spray for that. Um, fruit trees, if you have like an apple tree that had coddling moth, so coddling moth is, you know, the larva kind of bore into the core of the fruit and you cut open the apple and there's something black in there eating out the inside of your food, that's most likely coddling moth. And so if you do have that issue, rake up any fallen fruit and dispose of it. It could be um, harboring larva and once again, get that fruit out of your, out of your garden and put it into your land uh, waste bin or um, feed it to the chickens or something, compost it, whatever you're going to do with it. That's another important task. And there's probably all sorts of other things that I'm forgetting that you should be doing this time of year. So I think at this point, what I'll do is I just wanna point out a couple resources and we are gonna put the links to these in our chat box, but one is the OSU Extension Catalog. I mentioned two of the um, two publications this evening. One is at Analytical Lab Serving Oregon. So if you're looking for a soil lab, um, that gives you a, a huge list of them. Um, if you want to know how to collect a soil sample, we have a publication written on that as well. So you can find those as well as many other publications in our OSU Extension catalog. Uh, the other thing I want to mention is we have the OSU Extension monthly garden calendar. So if you're trying to figure out what you should be doing uh, in your garden at any time of year, you can go into our monthly garden ca calendar website and just click on the month and it will give you a whole list of tasks of things you wanna be thinking about and considering around your garden um, at that given time of year. So those are two resources I wanna leave you with. Um, and with that, I will go ahead and open it up to questions. Thank you so much, Erica. We have lots of questions already. So let me turn it over to Sharon to handle those questions. All right, and for those of you who are watching all of the questions appear and such, I'm going to try to kind of group them. So if it looks like I've skipped yours, um, don't worry about it unless we're getting near the end and I've skipped it and, and then ask it again and we'll get to it. Um, but I thought it might be useful to try to, to group them. We've had a couple about um, soil testing and one in particular, um, oh, okay, somebody's happy with an answer they got. Uh, so somebody has discrete raised beds and they're all separated from one another by wood frames. And they're just curious if you've got these separate raised beds, how do you go about soil testing? It depends. Are you treating the soil differently in those raised beds? Or are you always doing the same thing to them? If you're always doing the same thing to them, you're always adding an inch to com of compost to every raised bed. 
um, go ahead and treat them the same. So you would you would sample that the same way you would sample a huge field, um, whereas you'd go in and maybe you know from those four discrete raised beds, you'd probably want to collect ten subsamples at least. So you'd go into each bed and maybe take two two or three core samples. Um, so to take a core sample, you could just use a trowel and dig down about six inches and kind of take out a, kind of a profile of that soil. You want to scrape off just the top inch because that's just organic matter. So scrape that off, kind of remove the side. So essentially in the trowel, you're kind of just left with a slim core of soil. Throw that in a bucket, do that three times in one raised bed. So you end up with two to three cores in the bucket, go around to each of your four raised beds, do that, mix that all together, and then take about three quarters to a cup of that, throw it into a quart Ziploc bag, and that's essentially your soil sample. If you're treating those four raised beds differently, let's say one of them you grow blueberries at like um, acidic soil and you've been acidifying it, maybe in another, um, you know, you have some type of perennial plant in them, and then the other two you use for vegetable gardening. The two for vegetable gardening, you can, you're probably treating the same, so you could just take one soil sample from those, but you would want to sample the blueberry soil separately. So um, anywhere where you're doing really drastically um, different management practices to the soil, sample that separate from other parts of your garden. All right, thank you. Excuse me. Thank you. There were also a lot of questions on um, your discussion about uh, getting the soil ready and protecting it through the winter. So a couple of questions came up about compost. Somebody was curious about how you can tell finished from unfinished compost. Yeah, a good way to do that is just kind of smell it. <laughs> if it's, you know, if it still has that kind of rotting uh, composting smell to it, it's definitely not finished. Um, you know, a finished compost will have kind of a nice earthy smell to it. It's not going to smell like rotting materials or anything like that. The other is if it's your own compost, you probably know when you last threw some materials in there, when you last turned it. Essentially, once you've stopped adding materials and turning it, you know, um, you do want to kind of allow it to cure for a couple months or a month or two on the side. So just kind of knowing your own composting process and knowing where things are at in the cycle is another way to do it. You should probably, you can assume, um, you, can, you don't know, but you can assume any compost that you're buying, say, in a bag from a retail center or even from one of the, the companies here in town that sells Composted materials, you can assume that's finished compost. Um, that they've they've treated it, they've allowed it to cure, and then they finally shoveled into their bins where they then sell it to the general public. But for your own compost, you kind of have to keep an eye on it. And then of course you can always do the sniff test as well. But basically, once it stops, you know, usually with compost, it's going to kind of peak, heat up, heat up, heat up, heat up, and then it's going to kind of drop. And then as soon as it does that drop in temperature, then that's essentially when it the heat heating process, the heat treating process is finished. And um, at that point, you kind of move it to the side and allow it to cure for um, a month or so. If you're doing home composting and you've got some material that you know isn't fully finished, but you're going to use it in this sense as a mulch with the cardboard and the leaves and everything, can you spread it and let it kind of finish through the winter on your beds? Yeah, just keep in mind, um, if it wasn't heat treated, any weed seeds or anything mm -hmm. in there will not have been killed. And once you spread it, it's not going to have um, kind of the, the density it needs to, to heat up again. So it then becomes a cold, um, cold, unfinished compost with probably weed seeds and other things in it that you're then spreading over your, over your cardboard. And so you just have to be aware that you may be spreading weed seeds or pathogens around your garden. Somebody else had I just know this as well, like with weeds, if you aren't, you know, I, I, I don't turn compost anymore. I'm a lazy composter. I stopped doing hot composting a while ago. I'm all about lasagna beds and cold composting. So, but with that in mind, you do have to be careful. Like obviously if you have weed plants that have seed heads on them, um, you don't necessarily want to throw that in your compost pile if you aren't getting it to a good 145 to 150 degrees. So, you know, it really depends on the style of composting you're using. And same with, with pathogen plants. If you know, again, if you trust your compost process, you know you get it nice and hot, you have a thermometer in there, or you use the old machete method, 
um, to test the temperature. You know, um, if you know you're getting it hot, you're you're getting it up to temperature to kill weed season pathogens, then you should be okay. But if you're like me, where you don't like burning compost and you do the static pile cold composting method, then yeah, be careful about throwing weed seeds in there. You can throw the plant in there, but just remove the, the seed head of that weed plant um, and don't put that in your compost pile. Okay, thanks. We have a, a second composting question where somebody said, it, it, it seems like you're suggesting that the color of the materials you're composting determine whether they're a carbon heavy compost uh, material, they're brown or nitrogen heavy is green. But somebody is asking, they said, well, it, it's my understanding that color is not the determiner, but rather the intrinsic endowment of the particular material. So for example, with grass clippings, even if they're no longer green, they're still a green. Is that true? Or can you clarify that? Yeah, so they do basically, um, the lignans in the in the the grasses kind of dry out as the grass dries out, and so they do become a brown material over time. But when they are green, they're fresh and they still have that uh, nitrogen stored in them. Browns and greens is kind of a simplified way of talking about it, and it's just the way that people talk about it because it, it kind of is an easy way to explain to the general public without them having to memorize lists of what's 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 carbon and what's nitrogen. So you do have to take it a little bit with a grain of salt, but it's kind of just a general rule of thumb. So the, the basis of your question is correct, um, that it, it's not always cut and dry, um, but it is just kind of a general rule of thumb for people to, to follow. And there's, you know, the Rodale Book of Composting has like an entire encyclopedia about everything you could ever imagine composting, and it will tell you what its nitrogen or carbon content is of that material. So if you are really interested, you can dig into that information. There's lots of great stuff available. We do uh, composting workshops. Um, in fact, there's a number of them coming up this fall if you're interested in composting and learning how to compost. We have several listed in our OSU Extension Lane um, events calendar, which uh, we, we posted the, the link to in our chat. So come check out one of our composting workshops as well and learn about different methods, hot and cold composting. They generally talk about those things. Right. Well, and once you've got the compost, you also talked a lot about lasagna gardening and adding other materials. So we have a question about um, using cardboard and newspaper to protect your soil. Um, so there's concern about the organic or non-organic nature of newspaper in terms of like inks and how yeah. the paper was developed. Yeah, I meant to mention that. So most inks in this day and age are soy-based, but not all of them. So a good general rule of thumb is you don't want to use glossy paper. Um, you don't want to use like a uh, paper with uh, colored inks in it as well. So that's kind of the general rule of thumb to just if you're concerned about those things uh, breaking down in the soil, just uh, use you know your typical you know newspaper, which is black black and white ink on it, which is kind of hard to find in this day and age. Um, but most you know usually the newspaper will tell you you know in that inside column where they kind of uh, not that anyone I don't know if anyone gets newspapers anymore, but you know the inside page would always tell you. Um, actually what the source of that ink is. And a lot of, the, oftentimes it is uh, soy-based. Um, same with, uh, you know, uh, cardboard. There's the corrugated cardboard that has glues in them. You don't want to use that. Um, if it has any stickers or tape on them, you want to try to remove that before adding it to the soil. I didn't go into a huge long lecture about sheet, sheet mulching, um, but if people want more information on that, there's a lot of great information available online about how to sheet mulch and what you want to look out for in terms of newspaper and cardboard. Yeah, because we got a couple more questions to follow up on that. Um, somebody is asking if black plastic is a good cover for the garden during the winter. It is. Um, you know, plastic will photodegrade over time. So you just want to keep an eye on it. And as soon as it starts to break down, you want to lift it up and remove it. You aren't going to get the insulating um, uh, benefits uh, with, with just a thin, it depends on the type of plastic. They do have those like heavier woven landscape uh, fabrics and those do provide a little bit more insulation, but most of those like thin um, plastics that are used for like strawberry growing and other types of uh, commercial agriculture growing, those are very thin and they don't provide a lot of insulation at all. So 
Um, that's why I tend to recommend say an organic material over winter. You're going to get that insulate. If you, if you do a couple inches of it, you'll get a nice insulating benefit. And then they just break down over time and you have a nice organic matter layer um, hanging out of your garden. But I will say things like landscape fabrics, if you're looking for something around a perennial plant that's going to be in the ground for a while, then absolutely um, a landscaping fabric will provide some benefits. Another mulch that you had mentioned was straw and somebody's asking, where can you find straw in our area? Um, I'm going to allow folks in the chat to answer that one because I'm sure people have better resources than I do. So uh, go ahead and type in the chat where you're buying your straw straw from. Generally, feed stores have them. They all carry different things. So you might want to call ahead and ask what they carry. Um, but that's usually where I check are just feed stores. Somebody, uh, again, following along on that with uh, spreading leaves. When you're spreading them out over beds and throughout the garden, how deep do you spread your leaves? So again, you want a good four to six inch layer. Um, and that, that is usually good for winter time and insulation purposes. And again, with leaves, they can get wet and kind of matted. So if you have an opportunity to like put them in a little pile and run your lawnmower over them to break them up into smaller pieces, it's certainly better. But if not, don't worry too much about it and just uh, apply it as a mulch around your garden. Okay, and now we've got just a wonderful variety of miscellaneous questions. <laughs> um, somebody's asking about uh, the timing of adding things like lime and uh, rock phosphate. They say, I've always followed the instructions of Steve Solomon's book, Growing Vegetables West of the Cascades. And I've dug into the vegetable garden just before planting in the spring, a mixture that contains lime, rock phosphate, kelp, and seed meal. I gather that you're recommending that we dig in the lime and rock phosphate and fall instead. Is, is that what you're That saying? is what I recommend just because those things take time to dissolve um, into the soil itself. Um, so a lot of organic uh, you know, fertilizers, they're slower to break down. They're often considered slow release because they have to go through that microbial process in the soil before those nutrients are actually available to plants. So they have to go through the nitrogen cycle um, and get mineralized into plant available nitrogen, for example, for nitrogen materials. And very similar for phosphate, um, for you know, calcium materials, it's a mineral, so it just takes time for that to kind of dissolve and react with the soil. Um, so planting in fall kind of gives you a six month head start on that. You can apply it in the spring as well, um, but if, if you wait to correct your soil until, you know, the spring, you're going to be starting with that acidic soil. Let's say, let's say you test your soil right now and it tells you 5.5 and you don't do anything about it. When you go to plant in the spring, yeah, you can apply your lime right then and there, but, you know, it's going to take time for that soil pH to adapt. So you'll essentially be planting into a soil with a 5.5, 5.6, and then it's going to slowly um, kind of react with that liming material over time. So that's kind of the benefit of applying something like um, a liming material in the fall, especially the liming material. The phosphorus you can definitely wait on, um, but liming materials, it, it, you know, this is a good time to apply them so that soil you've already adapted and adjusted the pH by the time you're ready to plant in the spring. But yeah, I, see, Steve gives a great little recipe and you can follow that as well. So, you know, and just be aware that it's they're going to be um, a bit slow release. Well, and, and now we've got a question. Somebody's approaching this all from a completely different angle. They want to know, you know, in terms of all this cleanup, but is there a benefit to birds and insects if I leave all of my plants out there during the winter months? Um, the dead plants? Yeah, I think that would be my guess that they're sort of saying, you know, if I just leave all the dead stuff and, yeah. and just kind of leave it there as cover, is, is there any benefit to the birds and the insects? The birds probably, they'd probably, you know, anything that goes to seed, they would probably enjoy feeding on. Um, I mean, insects, sure, you know, I'm sure they would love it as well. You know, the plant material will dry and become kind of a carbon material. So sure, some of those insects will feed on. The problem is you might get insect pests as well. The insects you don't want that are kind of harboring in those, you know, especially again with plant material that um, 
maybe you had insect issues with this year, keep in mind there's still probably little eggs and things hanging off, uh, out on that plant debris. So you're essentially just overwintering that material in the soil and then next year, you know, um, it, it's essentially just gonna hatch and you're gonna have that same insect pest problem again. So that's why it's better to just remove it and compost it um, and deal with the material in the fall. But yeah, you can leave it. I'm sure it provides some habitat might provide some habitat for bowls and other things that you don't want around your garden, but yeah, it probably provides <laughs> habitat for some beneficial, you know, ground beetles and other things like that as well. Well, and to follow up on that with all of what you're doing in the uh, fall to prepare for winter and get things ready for next uh, year, are there things you can do that would help you avoid getting flea beetles and aphids and inchworms and spittle bugs next year? I mean, what I what I just mentioned, I just talked about the that they often, you know, some of them overwinter in the soil, and that's a lot harder to deal with. But certainly, for you know, insects that are laying eggs on leaves of plants and things like that, if you just you know leave that material there, you're essentially allowing those insects to to reproduce and and get a jump start next year right there in your garden. So it is better to kind of remove those. Um, over winter. In terms of other things, you know, I mentioned for fruit trees, um, you know, a good dormant spray in the winter. If you if you're growing like apples or plums, you can uh, apply a horticultural oil in the winter time. That usually that comes around January when the tree is completely dormant; it's lost all its leaves. Um, and you can apply a, a horticultural oil, and that oil will essentially kind of suffocate any eggs or anything that's left on that tree. It's also a good time of year because ladybugs and pollinators aren't active. So it's it's a time of year where you can apply something and know that you aren't impacting our beneficial insects and pollinators as much. So um, if you're growing uh, tree fruits or something like that, I do, you know, a, a dormant spray in the winter time is a good thing to do to kind of remove any of those um, insects. Well, and along the lines of um, dealing with fruit trees at this time of the year, if you've got um, fruit such as apples that have codling moth in them, is it safe to compost that fruit or? Yeah, yeah, that should break them down and decompose the larva yeah, or the little worms that are hidden inside. Mm, okay. Um, when you're removing plants from a garden, do you pull the roots out or you just cut the plant off it and leave the root? I don't. I tend to leave the roots because um, it will decompose in the soil. So yeah, that's that that's good fibrous material that will break down very quickly into organic matter. So I just cut them at the base. You know, it, it does depend. There are things like garlic where all of a sudden you're left with almost like a woody stub in your field, and that I mean, well, garlic's a bad example because it has a very small root system. But other, there are some types of plants that. Um, I have gone through then later and then had to kind of yank out that woody stub that gets left behind. But in general, I try to leave the roots in the ground to decompose. Uh, well, I got another worms. If you have wire worms, you might want to reconsider that. But <laughs> if you don't have wire worms, be thankful and uh, you can leave the, the roots in the ground to decompose. Um, Somebody else, we've just gotten a question that came in a minute ago um, about straw again and whether it's good for ornamental beds as well as your vegetable beds. Yeah, it is. Um, you know, the thing with straws, slugs do like to hide underneath it. Um, so just keep that in mind. That's true of most mulching materials. I, I think I find it particularly true with straw for some reason. They do tend to really like that. But yeah, it, it's a fine mulching material for whatever it is you want to mulch. For perennial ornamental beds, you can consider things like wood chips as well. Um, you know, places where that you don't want to be digging in every year to grow a vegetable garden. Something that's a little bit more long lasting like wood chips is actually a good mulching material for those perennial ornamental beds. That's another material I didn't mention that you can use as a mulch. We've got a question um, here that's about garlic plants, but it gets to if you've had a plant with uh, disease problems, is it safe to, to use that same area for that same plant again? No, so you're asking okay. about garlic plants with red spots that seem like a fungus. So can they go right back in that same plot? With no, again? no, you want to rotate away from that spot for a couple years. Generally, three years is a good rule of thumb for a crop, crop rotation in terms of the amount of time you want to rotate out of that crop. But yeah, absolutely. You, you want to rotate somewhere else because um, 
you know, any any fungal spores or anything are going to be hanging out in that soil um, and just kind of ready ready to attack the next garlic that you put in the ground. So rotate out to something in a different plant family. You don't want to put onions there either because they're in the same, they're also an allium in the same family. So rotate into a different family. All right. And we've got a real specific question. Well, uh, a um, kind of a garden plant you haven't talked about. What do you, what about raspberries? Is, is there something that should be done for raspberries right now? Yeah, you want to go ahead and uh, prune. Uh, this is a good time to kind of prune and uh, well, and a bit later in fall, usually I wait till um, late fall or even winter. Honestly, winter is a good time. Um, but you can go ahead and cut back the fruiting canes. Um, and then usually in winter, I'll go in and um, uh, depending on what type of raspberries you have, but you can uh, just go ahead and prune them um, uh, during the winter months as well. We should have some pruning workshops coming up. Check our OSU extension calendar um, going into December, January. And, you know, um, depending on COVID conditions, we'll hopefully be able to do something pruning wise this year. Okay. And finally, now a couple last follow ups. Um, somebody wanted to know the name of the lab you said that does nutritional soil analysis for $15. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. AL Western up in Portland. Um, yeah, I don't remember the test for the OSU Soil Health Lab up in Corvallis. Um, I'm sure people can put in the chat other labs that they may use as well. Those are just two that I know off the top of my head that I tend to recommend, but AL Western in Portland. Um, if you you can ship your soil sample, keep that in mind. You don't have to drive it to Corvallis or drive it to Portland. Go to the websites. Um, if you're if you're going to do a soil test, go to the laboratory website. Read their directions. They usually have very specific directions. There's usually a form that you need to download and fill out and send in with your soil sample. And they'll also they they offer different packages. So depending on what you want to test, just kind of read what their different packages are. If you just want like a pure pH test, you can get that. If you want more of a complete test, you can get that as well. And they'll kind of give you the pricing and other details. If you're shipping, you can dry the soil first um, just to reduce the weight of it. Obviously, wet soil weighs more, so you're going to have to pay more for shipping. So you can dry that soil out and then ship it. Um, the only thing that would really impact is nitrogen. But again, nitrogen is really hard to test in, in soil tests as well. anyway. So you generally don't get... Um, a, a good reading on nitrogen. It's usually the phosphorus, potassium, and, and other macro and micronutrients that you're looking at. Great. Okay. One last question. You had mentioned saving seeds. And someone says, I've heard that you should not save seeds as you may get mutations, that it's always better to buy new seeds. It depends on yeah, it depends on the plant and whether they're open pollinated or not. So obviously with things like squash. They can cross pollinate quite easily. And yeah, unless you're just growing one type of squash and maybe you have a screen over it or you live out in the middle of nowhere and you know that there's no neighbor within, you know, like a mile radius of you growing a different type of squash, then, um, you know, you can go ahead and save the seed. But with something like squash where cross contamination happens and that zucchini, squash, whatever it may be, any type of squash you're growing in your garden, they're going to cross pollinate and then you do get a mutation. Um, for other plants, um, that's not as much of an issue like tomatoes and things like that. So it really depends on what it is that you want to save seed from. And you don't, if you don't want to save seed, don't. I think seed saving is a great tradition, um, you know, especially as we've lost a lot of our heirloom varieties. A lot of those have ended up being saved by home gardeners and other people over time that have really kind of diversified our gene bank. So I do think there's a lot of um, good things that come out of people saving seed in their home garden, but there are risks to it as well. If you're, yeah, you could end up with a mutation if you aren't doing it well. Um, you know, it, it, and again, you don't want to save seed from a diseased plant. So you want to make sure you're saving seed from plants that are healthy and kind of true to form. Um, so this is not a seed saving class. So I'm not going to go into too much detail, but maybe that's a great topic for a future seminar. Um, but it depends on the plant, and um, there's a lot to know about that to go into. So yeah, if it's not something you're comfortable with, um, that's okay too. You can you can just go out and buy seed as well. Well, and actually, if you're if you've still got the breath for one last quick question, uh, came in as you were talking, uh, similar to the garlic, someone has 
uh, been cleaning their garden and discovered that their chives now have some small black specks all over them. And so they're wondering not so much about putting uh, chives right back in the same area, but whether or not now they should try to sterilize that area. Um, I mean, it depends, you know, on, it sounds like maybe a fungus. It depends on the fungus. Um, I think it depends what you mean by sterilize as well. Um, you know, are you going to leave the chives there? Do you just want to treat the plant and try to kill what's ever growing on it? Are you going to dig up the chives and put something else there? I would, I always recommend rotation. Um, so I definitely wouldn't plant, you know, if you're going to dig up the chives, I would put something else there. But if it's not a soil born pathogen, you know, you don't really need to sterilize the soil so much. Um, the beneficial fungi and bacteria and other things will eventually take care of the bad bacteria and fungi, and, and a lot of that will be broken down as well. Um, but what you really want to do is um, just kind of rotate out and rotate into something with a different family. And also note that I do see there's a question about blueberry bushes and pruning. And that's another thing, wait a couple months. Um, you know, the, the thing with pruning right now is if you, you know, there's a chance that we could get a warm spell in October. So you cut something now, we get a warm spell, it puts out a flush of new green growth, and then that's followed by freezing temperatures in December. That can cause a lot of frost damage. So the best time to prune things like blueberries and caneberries are really the winter months when they're dormant. Um, so blueberry pruning, wait until January, February to, to prune. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for um, covering A to Z in the garden. Yes. I have one other quick thing. Um, so as part of my position, I do have to do a certain number of evaluations every year. So when you go to leave this um, webinar, it's going to take you to a survey, an online survey. And if you would be willing to take five minutes or less and fill that out, I would really appreciate it. I think Sharon's going to put the link in the chat as well if you want, want to just click on it there. But uh, thank you everyone for your time and uh, appreciate all the good questions. Yes, thank you, Erica. That was uh, a lot of questions. So obviously a lot of interest <laughs> in the topic. And I just want to mention to people that are here still that our next seminar will be October 19th when we'll have Signe Danler, an OSU instructor. She'll talk about landscape design. So hope to see many of you uh, in October. So thank you for joining us tonight. And thank you, Erica. Thank you. Have a good night, everyone. Night. And everybody's gone.